Well, we have some notes coming out. I've taken the liberty to step away from our study for just this week because I did want to make sure that you're up to date with not only what we do in our business meetings, but why we do them. And that's in regard to a policy statement. We've added a number of policy statements to our documents and if you go online you'll be able to see what those are. That is not because our view of the scriptures have changed. They have not. We know that thus saith the Lord has the same authority now that it's ever had. So we're not making up new beliefs about the Bible. We're just living in a precarious time. There's a, there's a lot of debate among a lot of groups about what they are going to believe and what they aren't going to believe. So it's really important for us as a Bible-believing church to say that when we understand, accurately understand what the Bible tells us to do, then we are obligated to do that. We don't get to vote on whether or not we like God's ideas. So let me read to you what the policy states in the back. And you might think, I can't believe we need to write something like that because it's common sense. But it is because just because we believe we are right does not give us the, the right to be rude, to be unkind, to challenge other people's integrity, to deny whether or not they've had a life-changing experience in their own way. That's not ours to do, but here's what the tolerance policy statement says. And it's there to give us instruction on how we should respond, but it's also given so that it, if the day would ever come when we are being challenged about what we are debating or discussing in the public arena or what we are saying here, this is intended to give some clarification. So let me read it to you again. A copy is in the back and it will soon be in the policies uh, as listed on the web page. A tolerance policy statement held by the Fulton Baptist Temple. One. We will respect those who hold different beliefs than ours, than our own. Our beliefs are according to the word of God, our constitution, and our policy manual. By treating them courteously and allowing their views a place in the public discourse, we may strongly disagree with these ideas and vigorously contend against them in the public square, but we will still show respect for the persons in spite of the differences. Number two, we believe that some behavior is immoral and is a threat to the common good. Number three, our policy encourages each person's view to receive a courteous hearing, not all views have equal worth, merit, or truth. And again, that's put in there in part because people who are smarter than us tell us, well, you need to have statements like that in case there ever becomes an issue that is brought up in the public discussion. And you need to state your, your, not only your opinion according to the word of God, but also that you state it in a way that is understood by those who might disagree. So that's what we've done. Oh, we've had other policies, a recent one, and I won't read all of it. It's a little bit lengthy, so don't, don't be discouraged by that. But it's important. This is one that was given some time ago, and it becomes ever more a topic of concern. A uh, positional statement and policies on cohabitation and sexual purity. You know how much all of that's changed. Just a little paragraph here that says in the middle of all this, unfortunately this practice has crept into the Christian community with more and more professing Christians living together before marriage. The reasons are endless. It saves us money. We're going to get married eventually anyway. What difference does a piece of paper make? We are committed to each other. We want to make sure we are right for each other. And the list goes on. There are also several social issues that give rise to the increasing cohabitation trend. There is a breakdown in the personal morality, even in the church. Sexual values have changed and weakened personal commitment to purity that has led to compromising of the truth. Another short little paragraph down.
down farther. It says, Scripture defines fornication as sexual intercourse between unmarried persons. It is clearly recognized as a sin which God forbids and, inclu and includes negative consequences. Any sex outside of marriage is a violation of God's law with serious consequences. So those are just a couple of examples of policy manuals, uh, additions that we've made. Because it's really important that people understand we are committed to what the Bible says. Now the great question will be, can we trust the Bible? Aaron is going to make ready a video clip entitled A Hill of Beans. I did a study with our kids this last week on David and Goliath, and I wish I had time to talk about it. I mean, it was so exciting to study about the shepherd's sling and how it worked and how effective it was. But when I was doing that research, I saw a little title from a university that said, Could David have killed Goliath with a slingshot? And when you read it, now these are PhDs, you know, who are doing the study and they're looking at it. They're talking about velocity and, and how far back you can pull a slingshot and then stated that because of the materials of that day, there would not have been any materials with enough elastic, elasticity to, to pull back on the slingshot. And they had this whole discussion. The end result was, you can't trust the Bible. Little did they know, that's not the slingshot David used. He did not use one of these little fork sticks with the surgical tubing on it. His was the kind that was inside a uh, straps of leather and he'd whip it out had the effectiveness within a certain distance of a 45 caliber gun so that's what the world does they'll say things like this oh I'm glad that you're content to believe the Bible but any really intel intelligent person knows you really can't trust the Bible I think you'll enjoy this hill of beans as you can tell, we're out of sync. There's modern technology. But in doing that, he put in a couple of beans in the cup regarding an ancient manuscript. A few more beans in another one. A few more beans in another one. Books that are never doubted by the literary or, or intellectual community. But the Bible is often doubted as being unreliable. And in that picture, we'll show it again. Some of you may have seen it before. and Go on YouTube, you'll see it. But it shows him emptying a bag of coffee beans into this little tiny cup. We have multiplied thousands of copies. Not complete copies in every case, but copies. Let me give you an example of what we're talking about. Almost everybody has heard something of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those were found in the 40s, the late 40s, and they represented some of the very oldest manuscripts, scrolls on papyri that we'd ever seen and had ever found. They were about 300 years before Christ. Recently, there was another manuscript. It was from the Old Testament. They knew it was a uh, copy of a part of Leviticus, but it had been burned in a fire, and there was no way to unroll it to see what it said. People were very interested because of any book. Leviticus is not one of those books that would have been valued by the community. It was only valued by the Christian community and primarily the Jewish community. It had a lot of things in it that do not relate to what we think of today. But when they were able to use an MRI variation of it and to take some magnetic resonance and, and slowly digitally unroll that, they found that it said exactly what we have if you translated what was in that scroll, that burned scroll, and would translate it into everyday English, it was represented by chapter and verse found in our Bibles. When we talk about the integrity of the Bible, here's one of the verses we often use. You see it on the notes. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good 
works. The reason we put out these policy statements, it's a little like repainting the lines on the highway. Do you remember some years ago they resurfaced Highway 25 and for about a week or so we did not have any lines on it? Do you remember how that felt? You weren't sure where the edge of the road was. You weren't sure if you should pass or not. You weren't sure if the people coming at you would obey the, the logical good sense of the road. I mean everybody felt better when the paint was put down on that new road surface. That's what the policy manuals do. We don't make new rules about the Bible. We're simply repainting certain lines that are very clear in the Bible. The integrity of God's word. We can trust God's word. We can trust the way it was written by divine inspiration. We can trust the fact that God has protected it through the years, through preservation. That the translation process continues to go on and we find that with every new discovery of every new manuscript, it is valid. It is complete. It is truth. Second point, the interpretation of the Bible. Now I have another video clip, so I hope this will work for us. It's a little bit like having a substitute teacher. You get to watch videos all day. Oh no, not another video. This is one of my favorite, and you have to be old to appreciate this. I showed it once before, and people looked at me like, why would you show this? It's a great illustration. Because not only do we believe in the integrity of the Bible, but we believe that you have to be very careful to interpret it correctly. How many remember Ma and Pa Kettle from many, many years ago? All right, those who raised their hand, you're showing just how old you are. Because as soon as we put this up, people are going to say, this used to be popular? I can't believe it. But it was a great series of films. And... Ma and Pa's approach to math. There's a system involved. You're going to see that there's even sort of logic involved in it. But they come up with conclusions that nobody else in the world could ever come up with. May I suggest to you that you have to be very careful. Especially if you're watching TV preachers. There's a certain logic that they have. There's a certain pattern that they use. But they come up with things that are not in the Bible. We have all kinds of popular teachers and preachers and authors. And we've got to evaluate them. We need to properly interpret the scriptures. That's why we're a part of a church. Where we can be like Bereans and challenge and, and investigate. But unfortunately, there are many, a growing number of people who do theology the way Ma and Paul Kettle do math. Well, if this works, I think you'll enjoy it. I'm glad that worked. There's a certain logic to what they were doing, right? There was a method to what they were doing. But the answer was completely wrong. You've got to be very careful. There are a lot of popular books and popular authors, popular speakers, and they seem to be so dynamic, but be a Berean. It's important that we accurately interpret the word of God. Look what it says here. Work hard so you can present yourselves to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly explains the word of truth. And later on, but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone. That's why it's important we have documents like constitutions and policy manuals. The integrity of the word of God, the interpretation of the word, and then if those two things are check, check, they're correct. Number three, the instruction of the Bible. Because the Bible has integrity as the word of God, because we can properly understand it, interpret it, then we are obligated to apply the word of God. Look at the instruction of the Bible. You remember the story, Samuel, the little boy in the, in the, the home of Eli, the high priest. Samuel is being visited by the Lord. 
This is the first time in a long time that the Lord is speaking verbally to somebody, sharing his message with a new prophet. Samuel will be that prophet, but as a little boy, this was the story. After several failed attempts to understand that it was the Lord, we're told that then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak for your servant, speak, your servant is listening. That is the attitude that we must have. Oh, I can trust the Bible. Oh, I understand the Bible. Now I am obligated to obey the Bible, to follow its instructions. One of my favorite passages that I need to read frequently as a reminder and as an encouragement to me is found in Psalms 32. Look what it says in verse 8. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I mean, that's good news. God makes that promise not only to those of this day when he was writing to David, but he makes it true that's for all of us. Hey, listen, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Oh, again, that is so exciting. But this is the part that often speaks to me. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. How often have you had that experience? Sitting in church, listening to a message, reading your Bible, reading an article, and then you feel the Lord get a hold of the rein and jerk your head around one way or the other. And he says, listen, I don't doubt your faith in the word of God. I don't doubt your ability to understand it. But now the real question is, will you obey its instructions? Well, then there's a fourth point on our simple outline. The integrity of the Bible, the interpretation of the Bible, the instruction of the Bible. And this is why we have brought up the topic with our policy manuals, the insistence of the Bible. <clears throat> The insistence of the Bible. Let's read the scriptures out of Isaiah 66. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? My hands have, have made both heaven and earth and they and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. <clears throat> I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word. The insistence of the Bible. God says it is clear. These are my words. These are my expectations. Who are you to change God's word? Who are you to challenge his authority? Can I share with you a couple of situations that are very disturbing? In one of the recent Barna polls, identifying those people who claim to be born again Christians, who claim to have had a saving experience, a life-changing salvation experience with Jesus Christ, only 32% of that very selected group believed in the authorities of God's word, the absolutes of God's word. That yes means yes, and no means no, and wait means wait. Those of you that have friends, and we all do, and many of us as we reflect back on our many years, we had many uh, Methodist brothers and sisters that we admired and looked up to. Do you realize that the, the United Methodist Church is the second largest denomination after the Southern Baptists? And this week, 
on the 23rd through the 26th, they are going to be deciding by a majority vote on whether or not gay and lesbian pastors should perform marriages or whether any pastor should perform gay and lesbian marriages. That they're going to wipe, perhaps, depending on the vote, wipe away any negative word about this immoral behavior. What a world we are living in. If we gathered all of the great religions of the world into one room, <clears throat> individuals were there, and we asked them to give testimony, a Buddhist might get up and say, Oh, understanding the teaching of Buddha has given my life purpose and meaning. And we would say, whoa, that's what I would have said about Jesus Christ. And maybe somebody else, maybe a Roman Catholic would have stood up and said, I love so much my religion because all of the rules, all of the, the expectations are clearly defined and it gives me an understanding that if I work hard enough that I'll be, I'll be good enough to step into God's presence. And, and we might say, whoa, that's doing that for them. Maybe somebody else would say, uh, Islam has given me such purpose in my life. I understand the authority of God and now I'm under that authority and it tells me what I can and can't do and it provides for me great purpose. And maybe a Mormon would say, you know, when I joined the Mormon church, I mean, the fellowship I enjoyed with other people who were in that place has been life changing. They've been around me, they've supported me. And we might say, wait a minute. That would be my testimony. What makes my testimony different than all of those people from all of the major religions around the world? It is this, that my faith is not built upon mysterious ancient writings. My philosophy was not established by someone who shared something with his followers that has been slowly modified and presented and moved down through the course of time. No, no. My faith is built on God's word, the Bible. And this book has integrity. You may or may not be able to make the step of faith that says, I believe it is all that it claims to be, that it is the word of God. But there is no denying the integrity of this book. It's unlike any other book in the world. And if you take the time to understand what it meant to those who heard it the first time, that if you're careful about interpreting it for our time, that you do not make it say more than it does, nor would you ever make it say less than it does, then you understand that not only is it a book of integrity, it's also a book where we can interpret it. It's not a mysterious book. Not only that, it's a book that has instruction in it. When we understand what it says and we apply what it says, then it has great benefit. It is life changing when I understand the story of Jesus as presented in the scriptures. That Jesus came to die for sinners. There's no doubt I'm a sinner. That he came to die for sinners and that he promises eternal life to those who believe in him, have faith in him. What an incredible testimony we have. All of it is established on the integrity of this book, God's Word. As a church, we must stay the course. No matter who's up here, no matter how much culture changes, no matter how much society turns against us, we stand on the word of God. God insists that we obey it. Well, you know all those things. You've heard all those things. I trust you'll be encouraged by them. Let's pray together and ask the, ask the Lord to bless you. Again, if you have time, and we'd love for you to stay. Kevin Robbins is sharing a testimony. And then we'll, of course, be having communion together. Father, we're very thankful that we have a book. And in that book, we have truth. 
That truth clearly explains everything we need to know concerning Christ, who he is, what he did, the significance of it. Father, I'm asking, excuse me, I'm asking that we would have confidence, that we'd have courage as we go out into our community, that we would, with respect, with genuine heartfelt concern, but Lord, that we would make a strong stand on your word, that we would share the message that is in this book, a message that is for all people. Lord, we ask for that as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. Again, Hill of Beans, you can go on YouTube, just type in Hill of Beans and you'll be able to see that and you might enjoy it a little more. Thank you. <laughs>